OK, uh, welcome, everybody, um, to this uh, Energy Futures Lab uh, Imperial College um, uh, event on um, on smart uh, smart heat. Um, so uh, my name is Rob Gross. Uh, I'm now the director of uh, UKIRK, uh, the uh, UK Energy Research Centre. Um, I had a small role on this report and I'm chairing uh, this uh, this this event. Um, the way that this runs uh, using uh, Teams Teams Live or Teams Events, whatever it's called, um, is that uh, the, the audience participation will be through using questions uh, that we ask you to type into the chat. You can ask those questions at any time. And in fact, I'm told that we've already had some questions before the event has even started. So clearly there's a, a great deal of anticipation for uh, uh, for, for what my for, for what the presenters today are uh, going to be talking about. Uh, one of my colleagues, Aidan Rhodes, is going to be uh, monitoring the chat uh, all the way through. And we're actually effectively asking people to vote uh, for their favorite question using the like function um, so that Aidan can pick uh, and, and colleagues can pick the most popular questions uh, and ask those ones, um, ask those ones first. So that's the way that we're going to be running the, the Q&A. Um, if I could ask uh, the, the behind the scenes team to bring up the agenda for me, I'll just run through what we're the running order, the batting order for, um, for, for, for this afternoon and also introduce my uh, my colleagues. So I'm sure that will happen uh, right now. Uh, OK, can we get that into slideshow view, whoever it is that's, that's driving? Um, so yeah, very quick introduction for me that will run for another uh, no more than two minutes. Um, we're then going to get a, a presentation from uh, my colleague uh, Richard Carmichael, who was the lead author of this particular uh, piece of work. Um, and then we're going to get responses from our very uh, distinguished panel. And if I could just uh, introduce uh, each panelist in the order uh, that I've got them in front of me. So first of all, Richard himself, I mean, uh, Richard's actually uh, quite unusual at Imperial in that he's a chartered psychologist uh, and he's been working with with me and others at Energy Futures Lab and the Centre for Environmental Policy uh, over several years now and um, had a particularly impactful um, uh, summer. I think it was last year uh, when he authored a, a report uh, for the Committee on Climate Change on behaviour change, uh, public engagement and net zero, which um, was widely reported uh, in the media and featured on, on, on Panorama, amongst other things. Um, our other our panel members um, who will be responding today, we've got uh, Juliet Davenport, OBE, who's the founder of, um, of Good Energy, as, uh, as many, many people will, have, uh, will already be familiar uh, with Juliet. Uh, and she's been working in this area for, uh, for, 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 for a number of years. Uh, and she sits on the board of the Renewable Energy Association and Innovate UK. She's vice president of the Energy Institute um, and has a, a number of other uh, distinguished uh, affiliations, including with uh, the LSE uh, Grantham Institute. We also have uh, Jenny Hill. Uh, Jenny is head of buildings, industry and bioenergy at the Committee on Climate Change, and she leads the committee's uh, work on buildings uh, as well as the international programme. Uh, so um, I have certainly had lots of interaction with Jenny over the years in the areas of energy efficiency and the decarbonisation of heat. Um, so she's particularly well placed, I think, to to respond from uh, a CCC perspective as well as her own um, on the on, on our, our report this afternoon. And finally, not 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 least, uh, we have uh, Jan Rosenau, who is. Uh, Director of European Programmes at RAP, well, that's the Regulatory uh, Assistance uh, Project. Um, he's also um, uh, got a board, had board level appointments with the IEA, the European Council for Energy Efficiency, and he has a, a, a visiting position at uh, the Environmental Change Institute at uh, Oxford. Um, again, very much working in the area of energy efficiency and, um, and the built environment. I will be keeping these guys to time and to that end I'm going to stop because I've already gone one minute over myself so I'm handing over now uh, to to Richard to kick off uh, with his presentation thanks very much Richard thanks Rob uh, right so um, 
just to set up the aims of the, the paper um, a little bit first, um, decarbonisations, um, it's no exaggeration to say it's perhaps the biggest challenge for us to get to net zero. Um, and electrification of domestic heat um, particularly is expected to be a crucial, uh, play a crucial part in getting us to um, those net zero targets. So um, unfortunately, electrification of heat has received much less attention, I think it's fair to say, than electrification of transport and the challenges around uh, EV charging. So this briefing paper set out to explore the potential of uh, flexible, smart, low carbon electric heating in UK homes and looking um, specifically or, or largely at the challenges around consumer engagement because um, it will involve uh, consumers adopting new products. Um, it offers some recommendations for accelerating this adoption and um, um, uptake of uh, the products and services around smart heat. And this is in many ways a follow on to a previous uh, Energy Futures Lab briefing paper from um, uh, a year and a half ago, which was on UK residential consumer engagement with demand response. So this looks in more detail at specifically flexibility for heat loads and it draws on several excellent reports, including um, some reports by panel members. And um, hopefully it's an accessible primer to smart meets, but it's hoping to make a contribution to moving things forward as well. Um, just to add a bit more context on, on the nature and the scale of the challenge for decarbonising heat. Uh, heat uh, in homes in UK accounts for about 25% of total UK energy. And within a typical home, it's about 80% of energy use. And in terms of carbon, about a third of the typical home's carbon footprint. Um, just to sort of home in a little bit more on the, the sort of um, issues in the paper, obviously from um, uh, 2025, the um, future home standard is going to uh, require that new builds have low carbon heating. But for the 27 odd older, uh, million older homes in the UK, the challenge of decarbonising those and, and, and making low carbon heating work in though that housing stock is going to be a much greater challenge. Um, and Richard, could I just, sorry, I'm very sorry to interrupt, but I'm just concerned. All that we have on our screen is the agenda slide. So if you're, adva if you're advancing slides, then I'm afraid something's not working. Ah, something's not working. I'm Are sharing and I'm forwarding on. Have you got it in, I'm really sorry about this. Have yeah, 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 slides, it's in slides. Have you got it in slideshow? Yeah. Um, something has frozen. Okay. Um, so if you could stop sharing. We'll do. Uh, and then I'll reshare. And then reshare, and then hopefully that will fix the glitch. Okay, I've done that. That's, you... much, that's much better. So we, we can now see, I okay. think unfortunately, and I'm sorry I was a bit slow to come in and tell you what was go going on. So we didn't see you forwarding slides. Right. So I don't know if you just want to like flip yeah. back through I'll some do of those. Lightning recap. Okay, yeah, so there we go. Okay. it's all working now. Thanks for the interruption. Uh, okay, great. Um, so aims and scope of paper, um, obviously exploring um, flex the potential for flex flexible smart heat and recommending some some uh, actions to move that forward. Um, the challenge, um, I think I got to the bottom of that. So um, I'll just continue, otherwise we're going to go over. Um, so yeah, older homes is a much bigger challenge than new builds. And um, it's going to be, decarbonising heat is going to be complex and costly and it's going to involve consumers because heat is generated largely within the home, can't be solved upstream. So products and services are going to take time to, to roll out and we basically urgently need to um, begin in earnest to, to sort of begin that process, which is not going to happen overnight. And the approach taken in the paper is um, to present four uh, components or elements that will be necessary for um, decarbonising heat through smart, flexible electric heat. Um, I'll deal with each of those in turn. And then as the picture, the figure suggests, the interconnections between them, between these uh, elements are crucial. So I'll uh, come to how to bring it all those components together towards the end of the presentation. Um, the first of the four is the um, issue of switching from what is typically fossil fuel powered boilers, whether it's gas or um, oil, uh, 
uh, largely in the UK, to some low carbon heat source. Um, and despite the uncertainties around decarbonisation pathways for, uh, for, for decarbonising heat, um, electrification of heat through heat pumps is anticipated to play a major role, whatever else happens. And this electrification of heat and, and, and switching to um, electricity poses two big challenges for the power system. First one being, we're going to have to supply an awful lot more low carbon electricity to satisfy the increased demand um, coming from heat. And uh, if we consider the typical households consumption at the moment uh, and bring in, uh, bear in mind the context of electrification of, of transport as well, charging an EV would be expected to double uh, typical households um, consumption, heat would more than double it. And that's assuming some building fabric improvements. Uh, second challenge is balancing this bigger demand with uh, the variable generation that will be supplying it and also the, the constraints imposed by the grid. Um, the government seems to have um, done more commitment to the first of the challenges of, of generation rather than um, addressing the sort of need for flexibility in heat and, and yet heat is extremely variable um, both in terms of over the course of a year Seasonal variation uh, means that meeting the winter peak is going to be a huge challenge. And um, I won't talk about that so much, but we can think about um, interseasonal storage and backup heating and, and various options. Um, also, huge variation throughout the course of a day. Um, and of course, this means that uh, given the demand profiles, there's a huge risk that heat pumps could add to the morning and evening peak demand. Um, making things even more uh, fraught on the grid. Um, so fortunately, as with electric vehicle charging, um, there is scope and great potential for quite convenient flexibility to be enabled by smart uh, and automated controls. Um, so basically, smart heating controls can deliver um, system efficiency and Unlike electric vehicles, um, not just flexibility, but efficiency and reduction of, um, of demand for consumers. And, and they do this through three ways. Automation from whether it's self-learning um, apps or automatically responding to time of use pricing. Um, zoning within the home so that different rooms get um, managed differently um, uh, so to support comfort and efficiency and also being able to integrate various different technologies, for example, have a hybrid system which is um, uh, managing the heat coming from a boiler and also a heat pump, or, or sort of deciding whether uh, self-generated electricity from PV goes to the heat pump or to a storage device. Um, so what are the barriers then to adopting um, heat pumps? Clearly upfront cost is a major one. Uh, I'll get to unfamiliarity and, and other barriers um, towards the end, but um, in terms of recommendations, we can um, consider that um, it's a step forward that the renewable heat incentives are moving away from a tariff based payment system to the um, uh, help with upfront costs through a, a clean heat grant in 2022. Um, and also, as well as that, we can um, uh, hope that the affordability of heat pumps could be improved as well through removing VAT on installations, which should also include um, smart controls. But with reference to smart controls, the clean heat grants could um, have a, a, a even greater impact if the eligibility was um, uh, dependent on smart controls for the heat pumps as well, which isn't currently stipulated in eligibility for those. And in terms of um, consumer understanding and awareness, uh, currently the EPC or energy performance certificates um, don't recommend heat pumps and they don't reflect um, the accurately the costs or the carbon intensity of heat pumps because they're based on out of date um, information on the sort of grid carbon intensities that is going to be improved but as others have noted uh, it should be done in a way that is continually updated and ideally it should also be done with to reflect um, the cost and carbon savings from flexible consumption 
which um, can um, deliver um, lower carbon and cheaper electricity. The second of the, the, um, the two um, components or elements is uh, exactly cost reflective pricing. So as we've seen, there's considerable so scope for load shifting, and that's especially the case as we've seen with smart controls and automation, uh, and in a context of renewables and network constraints that give value to uh, flexibility. Uh, but consumers obviously need to be uh, incentivized by pricing to be in order to be flexible. And with thanks to uh, Rosno and Lowe's for the, the, the figure here, it shows the opportunity um, for um, influencing the demand profile through um, time of use pricing so that um, the consumption moves from the uh, evening peak. Um, so time of use cost reflective pricing has got a lot of potential not only for reducing consumer bills but also for making investments by consu from of consumers in technologies that enable flexibility um, more affordable and of course the EPC scores recommend te technologies but they don't reflect these, um, these savings. So barriers to adoption of cost reflective pricing um, well, there's essentially not strong enough incentives to either suppliers or um, consumers at the moment. The smart meter rollout, rollout will obviously bring in more customers uh, and make um, more customers and households eligible to, to uh, join cost reflective pricing and smart tariffs and uh, also will dictate the sort of timeline for the mandatory market wide half hourly settlement, which will encourage and provide the right framework for suppliers to bring things like that to market. But as, as others, and it's great that Good Energy are um, bringing out a, a smart tariff for heat pumps. But as, as Ovo and Powervolt and others have noted in the industry, um, the access to the market value of residential flexibility is not what it could be. So um, one recommendation for regulation is that this addresses um, just that problem and increases the value um, and the accessibility to uh, residential flexibility so that suppliers and consumers are more strongly uh, incentivized. Um, carbon pricing could also do this in the sense of adding value to um, flexibility. The third of the components is thermally efficient buildings. Um, current state is uh, something that presents something of a mountain to climb. 70% uh, of homes don't meet the EPC rating of C, which is the target the government has set, and uh, only 1.5% uh, meet the A, B standards. So clearly there's a huge way to go. And yeah, thermally efficient buildings could support low carbon heating in three ways. Uh, firstly, you wouldn't need so much heat to heat the house, so it reduces consumption. Um, it also enables you to, it also makes it feasible for you to heat the home before you require the heat and therefore uh, shift load from, from peak time. And um, also many of the low carbon heating systems just wouldn't really be affordable uh, or cost effective uh, to run in a very leaky home. So um, in those three ways, it uh, presents a great opportunity and retrofitting the, the millions of homes that we have in need of uh, improve thermal efficiency, could cut emissions, include uh, improve uh, well-being and also support the economy through commercialization of products, uh, particularly in the context of um, uh, uh, post-COVID recovery, uh, retrofit program could, um, could have a lot to offer. Um, barriers, of course, to um, getting uh, your home more made more thermally efficient are in inconvenience and disruption, uh, which is not not uh, an, uh, a small matter, but as CCC and others have pointed out, there's a potential to piggyback on um, other um, home improvements that would have happened for reasons of comfort or amenity uh, and, and carry out insulation, et cetera, at the same time. But the long payback cost uh, periods uh, and the huge upfront costs for, for many, many people are, are the main barrier. So um, grants and loan trust loans um, could support that, uh, address that problem. And again, the AT on energy efficiency doesn't apply to new bills, but it, it is applied to, to um, a retrofit situation, which is not helpful. 
Um, and the remaining um, barriers I'll, I will kind of talk about in context of, of all the, um, the four components later. So the final of the four elements is um, smart storage devices. Um, of course, I've mentioned preheating the home, but for, for many homes, especially those with limited thermal mass, um, storage devices um, can add um, additional load shifting ability. And um, the report considers the pros and cons of a range of um, storage devices. There's much more choice now than there was um, a few decades ago with the overnight storage heaters. But um, they each have their, their sort of strengths and weaknesses. Um, so, for example, uh, electrochemical storage batteries are extremely energy dense, uh, especially if they're used to run a, a heat pump. So you benefit from the coefficient of performance of the heat pump. Um, but uh, and you can also um, use them for other uh, revenue streams such as um, um, uh, ancillary services and grid balancing, but they're not, for example, uh, able to accept um, thermal inputs such as solar thermal. Um, and given the complexity and, and matching to other technologies, it's fair to say that more data and modeling and analysis uh, would be valuable in this area to, to support sort of matching to specific uh, household needs. Um, adoption um, of storage devices is limited sometimes by space, um, but their disruption should be less than building improvements. But again, upfront cost is um, something that needs addressing and regulation that would um, confer greater value on storage and flexibility would um, increase the cost effectiveness and affordability. And regulation hasn't been headed in that direction either in terms of um, uh, the regulation around flexibility and off gems um, review and also VAT is um, not headed in the right direction. Um, that's the fourth and final uh, component, but some of the barriers um, involved in all of those hasn't yet been addressed. So that's what I want to end on really. Um, the, um, the, the, the four components need to be supported individually, but also collectively, uh, especially because they, they work better together. So in this respect, better use of data, and uh, digital tools and ICT has a lot to offer. So I want to mention a couple of these possibilities. One is smarter comparison tools uh, for smart tariffs and uh, bundling them with hardware. Um, at the moment, you can't um, access uh, smart tariffs on price comparison websites. They're not in the market comparisons. Uh, you can't share your smart meter data with these services. And of course, that contributes to low awareness of these products. Um, and people already use price comparison websites for flat rate tariffs. So the idea of kind of estimating your bills on a smart tariff is even more uh, more of an overload in terms of uh, working that out for yourself. So smart tariffs, uh, smart comparison tools that share, um, allow people to share their smart meter data and actually include smart tariffs would allow people to get quicker, more accurate and more tailored comparisons. Um, it would reduce the uncertainty about smart tariffs, you know, people to have no visibility of, of what their bills would be at the moment. And also it would go quite a long way to normalising these products and increase uh, engagement with smart meters uh, as people would see the, the kind of products and services that the smart meters will allow them access to. And um, obviously incentivise suppliers to, to bring these sort of products to market. And work has already begun this summer uh, through the base funded Smarter Tariffs, Smarter Comparisons project that we're involved with. So um, uh, do get in touch if you're interested in that. And the second um, possibility that could be explored with ICT we, we, in this area. Can I, I, can I just hurry you a bit? Sorry, we're, we're yeah, running a yeah, bit behind. It's second last slide, I think. OK, so, you could try and get through them in, in, well, we're on minus six minutes now, so. OK, um, thanks. So yeah, the final one is um, addressing, again, this problem of um, unfamiliarity with technologies and low awareness, but from the other side. So while price comparison websites give you a um, forecast of what you would pay in a, a ex-ante sense, using 
real world performance of uh, these technologies once they've actually been installed uh, by getting ex post assessments done could also go a long way as well to, to reducing the barriers. Um, one of the problems with, with uh, heating and building technologies is you can't just try them for a month like you might an EV. Um, so this trialability is associated with um, slower innovation adoption. So if we mandated or encouraged ex post evaluations of, of people who have had these technologies installed, this would in the first instance collect some real world data which PCC have pointed to as a valuable um, step for um, informing policy. Uh, it could also inform industry practice and consumers. Um, so making the database publicly accessible, obviously stripping out identifying information, would allow consumers to look at what other people have done. It would reduce, this would reduce uncertainty about the uncertainty about these technologies uh, and installers. And by making others' adoption visible or in terms of diffusion innovation theory observable, um, this could leverage social influence and go a long way to, to sort of normalizing these technologies and supporting take up. So again, um, this is something that we're working on um, from now until next year. So in touch with that part of them. And well, do a lightning summary. That's the um, recommendations all in one figure. Um, I will skip to the end basically. Um, yeah, the kind of major contribution perhaps is the um, idea that data-led consumer services have a valuable role to play in bringing these four components together. And um, one of the um, impediments to that is that we do need greater data portability to enable these third-party consumer services. And I will end there to try and keep vaguely to the agenda. Very good. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm very sorry for, for having to hurry you a bit towards the end. Um, so uh, the we have our three panelists to uh, to respond to you. The first of whom I'm going to ask is is Jenny Jenny Hill, uh, if she could give her thoughts and comments in response. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks very much, Rob and Richard. So uh, first, I'd like to really welcome this clearly structured and very thoughtful piece. I certainly learned new things reading it despite working in this space for a decade. You'll be pleased to hear that I will now be considering skirting as an alternative heat emitter. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Um, so I have three uh, points. Firstly, by way of overview, we know that we face a huge challenge in decarbonising heat. It makes up a significant part of the 1% to 2% of GDP total costs, which the CCC identified for meeting net zero. And it has also been identified by the committee as the single greatest challenge in meeting the target because of, on the one hand, these costs, but also the complexity of a mass market transformation, which involves multiple technology combinations and indeed household decisions. So what I find so compelling about the focus here is that by valuing and enabling flexible heat loads, we can dramatically cut costs and carbon both for consumers and at a system level. And given that the given the analysis which my sorry, given that the analysis that which my team has done um, and which we continue to do for the sixth carbon budget, which we will be published in December, continues to underline the centrality of uh, electric heat as uh, as a central solution across different pathways. Um, I think you know, this is this is incredibly timely and um, and could be very impactful. So some of the main takeaways for me specifically here are these recommendations around how we can better value flexible loads and also the important enabling role that government and the regulator can play. So I was interested particularly uh, that you uh, rightly emphasise continuing to roll out mandatory half hourly settlements. Uh, taking a flexibility first approach to regulation, but also providing an accurate source of information at a household level, which truly reflects how the electricity system is decarbonising and the savings which are accessible through load shifting. One of, uh, one of the things I guess I've been prompted to do on my side is to think about how to integrate these better into the CCC's policy thinking, 
especially looking ahead to the heat and building strategy, which we have coming out later this year. So by way of very quick recap, we identified four pillars. The first is a clear direction of travel backed by standards. The second is making our, the financials work. The third is enabling through good quality information and skills. And the fourth we've termed getting on with it. And that essentially recognises the importance of planning to inform decision making and to keep costs down, but also the economic stimulus potential post COVID. So just very briefly and to wrap up, how does I how do I think some of this fits in? Well, it comes out strongly in, in the second one, making the financials stack up. So, you know, obviously by making low carbon homes uh, uh, financially attractive to consumers, um, we can greatly facilitate the transition. And uh, for me, you know, this is absolutely about um, about valuing flexible loads, but also doing that alongside uh, other recommendations from the CCC, like addressing relative prices uh, from um, the imbalance in relative prices due to policy costs being disproportionately uh, placed on electricity instead of gas, um, as well as other financial incentives. It comes out clearly in enabling measures, and I've increasingly been thinking about how we can look at EPCs as a route through to the uh, green building passports, which were recommended by the Green Finance Institute via PAS 2035. So I'm very happy to expand on that uh, if that's of interest in the questions. And then finally, uh, I think the recommendations on regulation are a, an excellent reminder to look more broadly at the role that regulation has to play here. So it isn't just about setting minimum standards or phase out dates on, on boilers. Uh, things like interoperability standards and of course the significant code reviews really do have a critical role to play. So thank you. Excellent and, and uh, very nicely to time as well. Thanks very much Jenny. Uh, the order I'm going to run through is I'm going to ask Jan, uh, Jan next and then Juliet uh, uh, to, to come in uh, at the end. So, so Jan, your, your uh, responses please. Thanks, thanks Rob and, and, and hi everyone. It's great to be here and to talk about this really exciting topic. Uh, just a word of warning um, that my rather noisy kids are downstairs um, as we are self-isolating right now and I hope they, they will behave and not cause too much of a disturbance um, uh, today. Uh, so Richard and, and others who have done this research, thank you for this excellent presentation and a really important piece of research. You know, I, I had a privilege to preview the report uh, last week and I find myself you know, rarely uh, agreeing with almost everything I read in the report, but in, in this case I struggle to find parts that I disagree with, um, which is really rare. Uh, my organization, the Regulatory Assistance Project, has actually launched quite a similar report in March earlier this year, which is cited in the um, Imperial College report and I even noticed a low profile in the report that looks very familiar to me because it's actually uh, from my own home uh, in Oxford. Um, so it's great to see that there's a lot of um, overlap and um, agreement between our work and what you've done. Um, you know, why is this perspective um, that the report um, provides so important? Um, it starts with the premise that decarbonizing heat for electrification is an opportunity that we can take advantage of. Yes, you know, the report um, and the research acknowledges that heat electrification means that we will need more renewable electricity. Yes, it also means we need to require investment um, for the existing electricity infrastructure. But I think what the report does um, well is that it, it highlights the tremendous benefits uh, that we can um, you know, leverage if we do this well. Uh, the report, I think, is very optimistic in its approach and looks for solutions rather than just pointing out the many obstacles of which there are many and in, some of those have been raised in the Q&A and we can discuss them later. But I think focusing on the on the benefits and the solutions is, is, is quite important and that's different from some of the previous work I have read on this topic of um, heating. I really appreciate that and I, I believe we need to change the debate um, away perhaps from just talking about the difficulties towards talking about some of the opportunities and the least regret opportunities in particular. I have made those points tirelessly over the last months um, and buildings can be a lot more flexible than we often assume. 
If they are efficient, you know, heat can be stored for many hours and the operation of the heating system can be optimized. <clears throat> and that's important. I'm sure that Juliette will talk about that in her intervention to accommodate a rising share of variable renewables. You know, peak load increases can be limited. They can't be entirely avoided, but they can be limited by smart preheating of buildings and using heat storage devices. Uh, the good news is that we already have the technology. It's already um, in existence today and I'm actually using it in my own home. In addition to the benefits that this delivers to the energy system, uh, and hence to all consumers, not just those who actually have a smart electric heating system, smart heat can also benefit households and businesses directly who take advantage of time varying tariffs. And I'm glad that more energy suppliers are actually offering such tariffs. And I know that Good Energy is about to launch a specific um, tariff for heat pumps. And Juliette can probably tell us more in her intervention in a, in a couple of minutes. I think what is important to point out is that energy efficiency is a prerequisite for all of this to be successful. You know, leaky buildings are less flexible and efficient buildings can act as thermal batteries with much longer off periods, sometimes several hours, even during very cold winter days. Currently, the existing building stock is not fit for purpose. It's one of the least efficient in Europe uh, and data from you know, some of the smart thermostat manufacturers like Tardo, for example, show this very clearly. Um, and that's something that needs to be addressed and needs to be part of the piece of, of um, smart heat. One piece I'm missing in the report is a review of existing experience, real world experience with this. And there actually have been a few pilot projects. Uh, De Denmark, Dong Energy have done this um, a few years ago showing about 30% peak load savings by smart operation, and there are other um, examples. So I think what could be a useful next step for Imperial College and the researchers is to look at some of these real world examples, the pilot projects, and to still any lessons that we can learn from them, and then maybe design new pilots that test some of the things that we're not sure about yet. So a lot of work needs to be done. Um, I think we're currently missing a clear policy framework. I'm sure most people who are in attendance of this webinar would agree with that. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the uh, government will address that with the forthcoming um, heat strategy, the building strategy, uh, but clearly the current framework is insufficient. Whatever your preferred technology option is, um, looking at electric heat, you know, we still install 1.7 million gas boilers using fossil gas and only 27,000 heat pumps per year. So there's a big d uh, divergence between um, what we're doing and what we should be doing. And finally, I think, and this is a call for industry also, we need to make this as easy and accessible as possible for consumers. You know, currently this is done by energy geeks like myself, um, but really what we need is a full package that does not require consumers to understand all of this, do extensive research and coordinate across multiple organizations and technologies. So I hope that industry will step up and provide consumers with an attractive package that brings all of this together. Um, similar to what we've actually seen with electric vehicles already. Those are my points for now and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, again, uh, for, for keeping it brief and, and keep helping to keep us to time. So, Juliet, you've heard all this uh, stuff from <laughs> academics and, and observers. What's, uh, what, what's the view from the real world? Um, thank you and, and thank you so much for this paper because I think um, my view is that heat has always been the poor cousin of first electricity and then transport. Um, heat is now one of the biggest challenges we have and also the least thought through. So when you hear governments start to talk, it's like a little policy here and a little policy there. So, so I kind of think of these challenges in, in, four, in four distinct um, pillars. The, the first one is I still think there's a bunch of research and insight and data analysis that we need to do overall to think about the system. And, and we've, we've thrown out questions here about how much can heat pumps do? How much can the existing gas grid with green gas or hydrogen do? How much do we need? How much heavy lifting do we need to do with energy efficiency and demand supply response? Um, and, 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 and what impact does that really have on some of the local grids and some of the national grids? So I think there's a lot more work that we still need to be doing in there because one of the biggest challenges we have is that politicians haven't got any nice big numbers to jump on and say, yeah, I'm going to change that policy and that, that lever will give me this in terms of decarbonisation. So I, I still think there's some work to be done there. I think there's 
loads of us who could get involved in making sure that that worked and Imperial obviously being one of the leading parts of that. So I think there's still more research on systems to be done in there, not enough on that yet. I think then um, if we think about the infrastructure and particularly gas grid is the biggest issue we have in this. What is it? Nearly 80 percent of homes connected to the gas grid. Um, and, and obviously banning fossil fuels in new homes is a good start. But but right now, housing developers are still incentivized to connect to the gas grid because it's zero cost. They don't have to pay anything to put an energy system into a, into a new home. So it is it is one of the biggest challenges we've got is what do we do with this existing infrastructure that makes it look such a good deal to be connected to the gas grid and to use gas? Um, and that, that is something that we really need to think through, i.e. how can you repurpose that gas grid? And then how do you make sure it's, it looks attractive enough to, to basically next time you replace your gas boiler to put an electric heating system in instead? I think then if I look at the marketplace, um, we start to touch on this demand side response piece, the half hourly, the smart side of this, um, and that is not there yet. So any time of use tariffs you're seeing, some of them are, are, are real tariffs, but most of them are gamified still at the moment. So we're still playing in this market. We're not actually truly delivering real value through into this market. And that has to change. Um, and that has to be led in part by regulation and regulatory reform. And I think one of the things we're looking to our regulator to do is to say there must be no backward step on carbon. Um, and what, what we see is I think there's 11,000 places of regulation that, that manage just the electricity market. Um, and you can imagine there's lots of little fingers and different pies across that. I think there has to be a carbon um, element any decision making that's going on on regulation across the board and that is not happening at the moment so when you see a balancing a settlement code change which is the core to doing all the half hourly management um, that isn't seen with a carbon lens on it's just seen with a lens of is this efficient to deliver value to the market um, and then finally I think we touched on customers and what customers need and I think the concept that Smart tariffs are not not valuated properly. But I also think I think it was touched in the paper. We didn't really go into it. This whole thing about consumer protection. Um, we need to make sure that consumers feel confident in this marketplace and that there aren't people out there misselling. I think we may already see be beginning to see misselling in the heat pump market. And that's a huge job of communication. I think government needs to get involved in the communication side of this. They need to get involved in the consumer protection and looking after consumers and making sure that there aren't the negative stories that can come out that then will undermine this fledgling marketplace. Um, so I think I think it brings out most of the points that have been made in the paper, but I guess I think about them in the four pillars that kind of helps me think through. And I think if you can move all those forwards, um, then we can get significant shifting in this marketplace. The question that, that I was asked about heat pump tariffs. I mean, heat pump tariffs are really interesting because um, I, I have a heat pump in my own home and um, energy efficiency is a key. So you have to make sure your home is insulated as well as it can be to make heat pumps work properly. Um, the other thing is that uh, you can use it as a demand side response piece because uh, I basically leave it on all the time because it's a low grade heat. So switching it on and off a bit like a freezer response is really effective in terms of a tool. Um, and then uh, from, from, from a commercial point of view, therefore, as a supplier, um, probably what I want to do is have something related to time of use, which is what we're looking at in this new tariff, plus potentially temperature as well. So um, one of the things for heat pumps is obviously as the temperature drops significantly, um, that, that potentially causes heat pump users a problem. So we're looking at what can we do around temperature that helps people during cold periods as well. OK, excellent. Um, so I hope that answers one of the questions. We did get one of the questions uh, already already answered, and perhaps Aidan, you could uh, you could reflect on that because we have more than fifty questions in the chat, and we have <laughs> and we have fourteen minutes. So um, so Aidan, do you want to just take a few of those questions and perhaps try and wrap one or two of them together where uh, where you can, and perhaps um, we can be a bit selective about which of the panel or to Richard. Um, we direct those questions to rather than trying to have everyone answer everything because then we'll probably only get through one. 
<laughs> okay, so yes, <clears throat> as as is said, we've had about 50 questions in, so thanks for voting on them. So we'll just go through a couple of the uh, most highly ranked ones. From John from Waxman, he says, currently a kilowatt of electricity costs about four to five times more than a kilowatt hour of gas. Is this not a huge barrier to the uptake of heat pumps, even though they use far more less energy? And how can this be addressed? And just uh, related to this slightly from Damon, um, you seem to assume that heat pumps are the only electric solution, despite their drawbacks in size of respect, size, noise and maintenance. Um, do you see a role for more directly acting electric heating that can be better zoned and controlled and deliver more radiant heat? OK, so um, why don't we direct uh, those questions perhaps to Richard initially um, and then I will leave it to the panel, but ask, ask one of them to volunteer first to come in and I'll only take that one. OK, I, I'll be brief. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, yeah, on the, the sort of uh, gas versus electricity price per kilowatt hour, uh, this is something that we mentioned in the previous briefing paper, and I thought we'd mentioned it in this one. I'll have to check. Um, definitely the um, social and environmental taxes are falling on electricity, and I believe this uh, change is changes due in that area and has been announced, if memory serves. Um, and I'm not sure I understood the zoning question fully, so I'll pass. All right, Juliet, you said you'd like to come in on, on those things as well. I was going to answer the first question, um, <laughs> but I can try on the second one. I mean, I think I think there is space for direct electrical heating, and I think we're seeing some technologies, probably I think we mentioned in the paper actually, particularly solar technologies where you could see solar heat directly dumped into a heating system as a storage system. So I think I think we're beginning to see some of those evolve. Um, and, and I think it will be, again, it comes back to this concept that we haven't spent enough on R&D and innovation in this area. And I do think sort of making sure we're making more R&D funding available, particularly on heat, is really important. All right. Um, we had a, a partial answer from, uh, <clears throat> I, can't, I can't see who it, who it is on the chat now, but we did have a partial answer from Rob Palgrave. That obviously, if we had a downstream carbon tax, on, on gas that would help to address the price gap between gas and electricity. I think the other thing is, of course, electricity is more expensive to make than it is to, the, the, than gas. Uh, and that's a, just a kind of a, inherently the case, although perhaps not a marginal cost at certain times of the day might be less, uh, less so. Um, so Aidan, could you pick a few more for us, please? Yeah, this one's from Anonymous. Um, most people don't choose the heating system, the builder chooses it. Do you think the focus should be on building regulations, not on consumer description uh, decisions. Um, this one from Maxine Ferk is similar to about the electrical um, question we asked earlier. One from Jeff Hardy. Is the incentive for consumers for through time of use tariffs and network incentives sufficient, even if it was more cost reflective? Given lack of engagement in the energy market generally, is there a case for new energy business models that take some of the gain and some of the pain away from consumers? OK, so why don't we deal if we just deal with the building regs uh, uh, question first, I'm going to direct that actually to Jan and Jenny and see what their thoughts are. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I think that's a really good point. And uh, you know, my view is that if we just try to achieve what we want to achieve by using subsidies, uh, you know, government grants or loans, yes, we will get some uptake, but ultimately um, you know, that is limited. And I think experience in other countries where there have been extremely generous subsidy programs, take the KFW programs in Germany, for example, you know, uptake is still way too low and the renovation rate uh, and the replacement rate of fossil heating systems is too slow. Um, so ultimately, some regulatory backstop may be needed and will probably be needed. What that looks like is very complex and it's not easy to say. Um, I don't think the EPC rating system, for example, is fit for purpose and could be used for that. Um, but clearly regulation has to play a role. We cannot rely on consumer demand simply changing in the way that is needed to meet net zero. OK, Jenny, do you want to comment on that one? Sure. Uh, so I think that's a great question. It is um, what I emphasised as part of the first pillar that I mentioned in our proposed policy package. And yes, we've seen how 
the government has come forward with uh, building regulations for new homes, um, the future home standard, which is an important marker um, and uh, I think should be quite transformative at a supply chain level as well and help build skills and familiarity with the technologies. In terms of how we get to net zero emissions in 2050, I have to say it's pretty impossible to think about how this could be achieved without, without some kind of strong backstop for phasing out uh, gas boilers. And that's why my committee, the Committee on Climate Change, has a recommendation uh, to uh, phase out uh, gas boilers from 2035 at the latest. It's why the CBI have recently come out and adopted the same recommendation. And uh, you may have seen the UK Climate Assembly also came out today and launched its recommendations to Parliament. And as a, uh, a result of the, the six month deliberative process that they went through with 100, um, 100 citizens taken from the general public um, and, uh, and, and representatively sampled, they have come out with a recommendation to phase out gas boilers between sometime between 2030 and 2035. What's really what's really interesting there, I think, is that you've, you've got that support from pillars of the establishment like the CBI, but also from uh, these citizens that, that have um, taken part in this process. Um, but you know, clearly, uh, you can't do that without thinking about the wider impacts, without thinking about fairness, um, without uh, supporting people by having good quality information at a household level. And those were all things, again, which came through in the Citizens' Assembly uh, report and recommendations. All right, um, so I'm slightly randomly bouncing these around our, our speakers and panel, our speaker and panelists, so apologies for that. Aidan, there was a, the, the other ones you read out, so there was something about, um, and I saw this from Keith McLean as well, there's something about um, if we won't respond, the price sensitivity isn't there. Um, if it's not there, this is Jeff Hardy's question as well, you know, um, Richard, could you could you come back on, on, on that question? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can speak to Jeff's question briefly, uh, if I've understood it correctly, about new business models and offers that um, uh, can be attractive to consumers. Uh, I, I think we agree on this. I, um, again, if I've understood the question, I totally agree that new offers from from um, suppliers, etc., that manage this complexity and, and put everything together in a nice accessible package uh, and manages the risk as well that, that could be there around flexibility is incredibly uh, would could be incredibly valuable for getting consumers engaged. But I think also, even if those are great new business models, um, I think there's probably still a need for people to be supported in, in deciding whether that's right for them and, and their house. So the sort of, you know, price comparisons, et cetera, and the database to see what other people are doing could be still useful. And um, even if it's great, and even if people, some people take it up, making their adoption visible, uh, and, and this is sort of seen in, sort of photovoltaic um, panel adoption, uh, there's this effect that if, if your neighbour gets a panel, then you're more likely to get a PV panel as well. So making the adoption more visible can really help to sort of accelerate mass adoption. But I totally agree on, on the sort of new offers that and models that are required. There's a kind of there's a kind of more of a killer question uh, that's related to this, which which is that uh, if people don't engage, don't care, whether they're going to save themselves uh, 500, 200, however many pounds per year, what, why would that change if they're not engaged? They're just not engaged. They're not price sensitive. Anyone want to come in on that? Um, I, could, I could add something potentially from some of our research and then, then also take a step further on the, on the pricing question. So it, kind of what our research has shown, particularly on smart meter implementation, and what, what, what I think is fascinating is government has changed its attitude to how it's advertising smart metering. So if you put smart metering just in the context of saving money, it didn't work. Um, that People weren't interested. The amount of money that people were proposing to save wasn't enough to get smart metering really widely uptaken. If you put it in the context of a wider societal need and requirement, so solving climate change, supporting clean air, some of the wider pieces, 
um, it had much more cut through. And I think this is this is the point with these time of day tariffs. It should you need to be talking about them, not just in the context. So you can talk about saving money. And I think that's a really good first tick box. But you need to think about tapping into the wider community on, on um, consumer behavior and what the wider community is wanting. Um, and, and just one final point, which Jeff might have been pushing towards, because I know Jeff's passionate about regulatory change. One of, one of the points I was making about the 11,000 pieces of regulation, one of the big changes that Ofgem has recently tried to push through is something called TCR, which is um, Targeted uh, Charge and Review. And what that did was um, it reviewed the charges of the local distribution networks. And what that ended up doing, um, the way they did it meant that you were incentivized to use more power um, and you were incentivized to transport more power through a national grid, so less local power, um, and more of it. And and so the, the when you're looking at what the regulator do, it seems to be stepping away from where we actually need to go from a zero carbon point of view. OK, thank you very much. That's that's really interesting, Julia. Um, Aidan, we may have I may have inadvertently skipped one of the uh, questions that you read out. We, we're down to our final two minutes and we will be finishing at one. So if we uh, we might cut off was what was was there another question in there? No, I think we've answered the ones on um, tariffs that we talked about. Uh, I can read out a couple more, but it seems to be like I, we're running out of time. No, I think we'll run out of time if you do that. I mean, just to make a comment, some of the questions have asked us about hydrogen. So I should just uh, say that we deliberately this the, that was the scope and focus was on smart electric heat, which isn't to suggest that there isn't a role for decarbonised gas. Uh, or, or, or other uh, heating solutions, but there are important questions around how we can use smart uh, for, a, for for electrified heat, which obviously is one of the options. Um, we, so we, can we, I just uh, sort of chip yeah, in on that? There yeah, is something do. there is something in the report for people who are interested in hydrogen that be for today and the patients kind of pretty much ignored it. There there is a there is a bit about gas network and hydrogen in the report. These are obviously very, very fundamental infrastructure questions that we're facing. Um, I can only say uh, thank you to everyone who sent a question and sorry that we were only able to get through a handful of them. Um, we will forward all of the, the those questions on uh, to the authors and and clearly this is a conversation that we've got a very informed audience and this is a conversation that we're all engaged with. And it's a conversation that will continue and it's hugely, hugely important uh, for, for policy. But I'm afraid that for this afternoon, I've really only got time uh, left to thank Richard, uh, to thank uh, to thank our panelists, uh, Juliet, Jan and Jenny, uh, to thank Aidan for, uh, for, for doing his best to, to find his way through lots of questions and to thank you all for for, for sending so many questions in. Um, and um, I'm sure this is one uh, that's uh, to be continued. And I should also thank the guys behind the scenes. Uh, so Phil and, uh, and Connor and others in Energy Futures Lab who've been um, making sure that this runs uh, so smoothly and is such a successful event. I think that's it. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.